Um, tonight we're going to talk about homecoming. <clears throat> and a lot of people with the holiday season are going to go home. And I hope that you have a safe and a delightful time at home. But what I'm talking about is that cliche, you can never go home. And in a way, that is a cliche, a saying, a proverb that comes out of this story that we're going to look at uh, for a few moments tonight. Um, I remember a time where I was getting my hair cut and my barber and I were talking a little bit. And he was telling me this story about how uh, him and his wife were wanting to buy a house. And it just so happened, living in the same town where he grew up, the house that he grew up in went on the market. And it was very reasonably priced. In fact, he was pretty shocked at the price. And he came home and he said to his wife, we need to check this out. Because, boy, I remember that being a, a, a rather large house. And I remember that being a, a, a well-established, uh, well-taken-care-of house. And so his wife and him went uh, with a realtor and saw the house. And he said, he says to me, I was shocked how small that house was and how beaten up that house was. And after looking at it, I thought, wow, it's overpriced, not well-priced. And he says that that's just kind of that idea is that things are never the same when you go home. You never can go home because it's just never going to be the same. Your perceptions are different. Well, we're going to talk about Jesus going home. And as you look at Jesus' ministry at this point, he has been down in Jerusalem. He had a visit from a man named Nicodemus, and one of the evenings he was there. And he says to Nicodemus what he needs to hear. He says to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And there's some confusion and there's a discussion. On his way back to Galilee... <clears throat> He meets a Samaritan woman at the well, and a discussion about water, living water, begins. And that spends several days with Samaritans coming to Jesus and talking to him. He comes back to Galilee, and he goes back to Cana, where he did his first miracle, and he performs a second miracle, a miracle of healing over distance a miracle of healing the nobleman's son. Well, that, story's, that story or the stories are told in John 3 and John chapter 4. But between John chapter 4 and John chapter 5 is an incredible span of time that the synoptics cover, but John does not. And so it is believed if we look at this chronologically... We now end up from John chapter 4 to Luke chapter 4. And if you would begin reading with me in John chapter 4 verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues. And he was praised by all. So what Luke is telling us is that as Jesus comes back to Galilee, this is early on in his ministry. He's in Galilee and he's going from one town and one city to another. And he's going into their synagogues and he is preaching. And the people of Galilee are receiving him well. They are amazed at what he is saying and how he is saying it. They are amazed at what he can do. And I think what Luke is, is doing is he's saying at the beginning, as Jesus started out, things went really well. But eventually, opposition would grow. And one of the very first times Jesus reaches opposition is when he goes home. And so we're going to talk about Jesus' homecoming, Jesus going back to Nazareth. 
And going into the synagogue where he went every Sabbath growing up. And what happens there. This is an a interesting story because in the midst of this homecoming in the synagogue, <clears throat> Jesus quotes a proverb, a oft-used and well-known proverb. Notice verse 23. And Jesus said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And that has become one that's still used today in, in our circles sometimes. But in response to that, Jesus says something that at that time doesn't appear to be a proverb, but he becomes a proverb. Verse 24, he said to them, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And we use that today as a proverb as well. We use that as a way of saying, just as we started, you can't go home. <laughs> it's not the same. People don't look at you the same way. There's also um, a little debate about this story in Luke with the ones told by Matthew, Matthew 13, verse 54, and Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Some believe it's the same story, but others believe that Matthew and Mark record a second homecoming that doesn't go well either. Um, I am of the notion at this point that these are the same, that it's one homecoming. The language and the wording is, is, is just too similar. So we're going to treat Matthew 13 and Mark 6 as Matthew and Mark's story of Jesus' one and only homecoming. And so Jesus comes home, and what happens is he's rejected. Well, like I did this morning, I want to look at a passage that encapsulates the lesson I want to bring out to you. Uh, tonight. And that, that, that passage, like today was Hebrews 4 this morning, that, that passage is Luke 17 verse 1, where Jesus says these words to his disciples. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks should come, but woe to him through whom they come. Uh, we often talk about the stumbling blocks that are in the world today and why it is so hard to get people to believe in Jesus. They just keep tripping over him. And tonight, I think this story presents one of the biggest stumbling blocks to the chief cornerstone called Jesus. If nothing else, I want to get across our focus on this one particular stumbling block. And so Luke 17 is going to be our summary passage. And so let's take a look at what happens as Jesus goes home and enters into the synagogue. Luke has told us he has been received well by all the, these people of Galilee. But when he comes home, it all changes Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and he found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled 
in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him. And were wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. I'm going to stop right there for a second. I, I, I want you to, to notice as Jesus stands up and he's given the book of Isaiah. And it's him that decides where he's going to read. That's not always the case in the synagogue. A lot of times the synagogue official picks the passages. But Jesus picks Isaiah 61 verse 1 and what I would say 2a. What is interesting is he doesn't quote all of verse 2. <clears throat> now, how much should we make out of that? Probably not much. Because Jesus' Bible didn't have chapters and verses. And so he has found the place where he wanted to read, and he read the words that he wanted to read. And later on, the words Jesus read came to be part of chapter or verse 2. I don't think we need to make too much out of that. But more importantly is the section that Jesus read. He read this section about, I want you to notice, about preaching the gospel to who? To the poor. That he's been sent to proclaim release to who? Captives. I, I would take that means captives of sin. He has come to give recovery sight to the blind and to free those who are oppressed. Why? Because this is the favorable year of the Lord. But then even more amazing is he closes the book. He sits down and everyone is just kind of anticipation of what he's going to say. <laughs> and he says to them, I have fulfilled this scripture. It's been fulfilled. And, and what he is meaning is, I'm doing that right now. It's already started in Galilee. You have heard of the things that I have done. And I'm going to continue to do this. Imagine you have a preacher come in while I'm gone, and he opens up a section of the Bible, and he reads it, and he says, I just want you to know, I am the fulfillment of that passage. How would you react to that? I would expect you not to react very well. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Thinking you are the fulfillment of some prophecy. Well, that might have been the, the impact that it was to Jesus as he said this. But I want you to notice that at first, verse 22 Everything is well. They're speaking well of him. They, they are wondering at his gracious words. They're kind of impressed. But deep down, Jesus knows what's inside their heart. And so what's going on? What is Jesus doing here in this synagogue by reading Isaiah 61 and then talking about the fulfillment of it? Well, what he is doing is he's trying to show his own people that he is the Son, the Son of God. But in verse 22, at the very end, all that they could see was he is the Son of Joseph. And that's all that they would ever see in Jesus. That he's just the Son of Joseph. We, we've known him his whole life. Who is this guy? I want us to, to pay a little bit of attention to Jesus and Isaiah. I want to give a little background to, to build this up. How can Jesus make this connection? Why is he making this connection? Well, number one, it's because of these, these words that they're hearing about what Jesus is doing in Galilee. And what happens is... They're not believing it. They're not buying any of it. They're basically saying, hey, let's see it for ourselves. Prove yourself, Jesus. And so I want you to look at these words of Isaiah 61. They sound very familiar to another story in Jesus' life 
where John's disciple, John the baptizer's disciples, come and ask Jesus a question. Do you remember what they ask him? Are, are you the one? Or are we supposed to look for someone else? And remember the answer Jesus gave? Matthew 11, verse 4 through 6. And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and what you see. And what is it that they're hearing? And what is it that they're seeing? Here it is. The blind receive sight. That's right out of Isaiah 61. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. I think we have a tendency to look at that answer. And our conclusion is they go back to John and say, Wow, he definitely is the one we're looking for. Because look at all the great things he can do. And, and that's part of it. But for a Jew, there's more to it than he can do these great miracles. What Jesus says to John's disciples comes right out of Isaiah and many of the prophets. It is a language that they should pick up on. It is a messianic language. It is what Isaiah said would be the Messiah and his work. And so it's not just, hey, look at these miracles he's doing. It's... He's doing the exact same thing Isaiah said he would. Let me give you some examples of this. Isaiah 11 verse 4. Isaiah paints this picture throughout. The, and what is Isaiah? He's the messianic prophet, right? And he paints this picture throughout his chapters that Israel is lost in sin. And as you look at Israel, you see all the effects of sin. You see the corruption, the king, the prophet, the priest. They're corrupt. The people are lost in sin. They see the full effects of their sin. People are poor because they're being oppressed. People are sick. People are afflicted. And that's the impact of a society that says, hey, we want to serve Satan. You look at our society today, and you can see some of the same impact of sin. The homelessness that's caused by drug use. The violence that's caused by a hatred for a fellow man. It is all the opposite of what God preaches to us to be. It is exactly what Satan wants in the world the decaying of a society into evil and destructive sin. And that's the way it is. But Isaiah says, listen, there's coming a time where it's all going to change. And God is going to send you someone. <laughs> He's going to send you a Savior. And this is what's going to happen. Isaiah 11 verse 4. But with righteousness, He will judge the poor. He's not going to be like their leaders who judge them in unrighteousness, who oppress them. This one will judge the poor in righteousness and decide with fairness the afflicted of the earth. <clears throat> he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. It, it, it's going to be all overturned. The, the, the poor, the afflicted, they're going to be exalted. The oppressor, the wicked, they're going to be destroyed. That's what the Messiah is going to do. Key words there, poor afflicted. Uh, look, if you would, at Isaiah 29, 19 and 20. The afflicted also shall increase their gladness in the Lord, and the needy of mankind shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless will come to an end. The scorner will be finished. Indeed, all who are intent on doing evil will be cut off. You go through Isaiah, you're going to see passages after passage like this that talk about the captive being released, the poor being exalted, um, the lame to walk, the blind to see. That's what the Messiah is coming to do. And that's why Jesus reads this passage, Isaiah 61. It is one of many that talk about the work of Messiah. 
And so if Jesus does the things of the Messiah, and Jesus says the things of the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. But there's a stumbling block for his own people. And so here it comes. Here's the stumbling block I want to get across to you tonight. Familiarity. It's a big one. Being familiar with something or someone has become one of the biggest stumbling blocks of people coming to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Doesn't this sound a lot like what we have in the world today? People serving Jesus with man-made traditions. And when asked upon, by what authority are you doing these things? Well, this is what the people of Nazareth stumbled on. They said something like this. We've known Jesus all our lives. We know his father, Joseph. We know his family. We, we, we saw him being raised. Well, when it comes to tradition, people say something very similar. We, we've worshipped this way for years. Or something like this. We've always believed this way. And that's why Satan doesn't just want us to, to add a little something to our belief or a little something to our practice. But he wants us to do it year after year after year after year after generation after generation to where we just think, wow, this is what I'm familiar with. This is the way it's been. This is the way my family does. This is the way my church does it. You see, when we talk about familiarity, people and things that we're familiar with, well, we feel safe with them. We feel comfortable with them. We have learned to trust them. All have accepted them. And so those perimeters have made this, this a big stumbling block. And someone might say, well, what's wrong with, with sticking with what feels safe and what feels comfortable? Well, what, what's wrong with uh, the things that we've learned to trust? What's wrong with the, the, the fact that a majority of people accept this. Can they all be wrong? And here's the problem. What if they are wrong? If you only do that which is comfortable and safe. That which everyone else agrees with. You may be in the wrong. You may fail to see what's right before you. Just like the Nazarenes who would not overcome their familiarity with Jesus. Uh, anyone that has come out of what we might say the religious world, the denominational world, uh, out of those backgrounds and those paths to become a true New Testament Christian are people who have overcome the stumbling block. They did that which was not comfortable, that which was not familiar to them. They opened that door and they took that leap of faith because they saw the evidence of what was taught in God's Word. It's a big stumbling block. But you know what? Going back to our text, it's not a problem yet. They're still speaking well of him. They, they still kind of like what he is saying. But then if you look at verse 23, <clears throat> Jesus kind of turns things a little bit. And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. There's that, hey, prove yourself. If you think you're someone great, prove yourself. You've got kind of this doubting Thomas. Unless I see it with my own eyes, I'm not going to believe. And so then, verse 24, he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And then,
what Jesus goes on to say is the, the, the true problem with the people of Nazareth. You see, not only did they know Jesus, but Jesus knew them. And what Jesus brings out is your familiarity is not only a stumbling block, but, but it makes you just like your forefathers in all the ways that God was displeased with them. And so he, he, he brings up the story of Elijah. Look at what he says, verse 20. But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows where? In Israel. All these widows in Israel, uh, among your forefathers, among your descendants, in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath. In the Gentile city, I added that, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Look at what he says in verse 27. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. But none of them was cleansed. But only Naaman the Syrian. Why did God send Elisha to a Gentile widow to be provided for instead of an Israelite widow? Why did he cleanse Naaman, a Gentile from Syria, and not one of the lepers of God's people Israel. The reason is God's people Israel didn't believe in God. That's why there was a famine. That's why the lepers weren't coming to be healed. They had a stubborn, unbelieving heart. And Jesus brings it out to them. Unless you change your heart, unless you, you, you are set to, to not be like your forefathers, you'll never believe in me. So I want you to, to get this point. When Jesus says, I fulfilled this scripture, they're okay with that. He's reading these scriptures and say, hey, this is me. They're okay with that. But when does it really become a stumbling block? When does the stumbling block uh, have the full effect? When he starts addressing the truth to their life. Look at what their reaction. They went from speaking well of him within a matter of moments. Verse 27 or verse 28. And the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to a brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. Now, people are okay. With Paul preaching the gospel. Until it affects their pocketbook. When did those silversmiths start having trouble with Paul? When what he was doing affected them. Uh, when, when did the, the masters of that slave girl that was demon possessed. Start having a problem with Paul and Silas. It's when their pocketbook was affected. When do people start uh, uh, having a trouble with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's when their life is put in the light of the gospel. No wonder so many people don't want this opened. No wonder we don't want this in our schools. It's okay. Until you start talking about my life and what I need to change. People could very quickly go from speaking well to being filled with rage. So why does Jesus say these words? 
Look at Mark chapter 6. Again, I believe this is part of Mark's account of this story. As he talks about Jesus coming back to Nazareth, Mark adds this little detail. As Jesus is in Nazareth, verse 5, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief as he was going around the villages teaching. They wondered at his words at first. He wondered at their unbelief. And I've made this point before, and I think it's true. It's not that he couldn't heal them because they weren't believing. They didn't have a believing heart. It's, he did very few miracles because the people of Nazareth were not coming to him. Just like the lepers in the days of Elisha were not being healed because they weren't coming for healing. It's a matter of unbelief. And Jesus knows that. And he addresses that. The people were not believing the reports about Jesus. And so they wanted to prove himself in reality. They didn't even give him a chance to do that. And so not only do we get this great lesson about a stumbling block, but we got this great lesson about the preaching of Jesus. What, what, what kind of preaching do we want? Jesus was not shy to tell people what they needed to hear. Even if it was going to offend them. Even if it was going to anger them. He didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. He told them what they needed to hear. To the apostles... He said, oh, ye of little faith. Do you think they liked hearing that? I would imagine they didn't. To the Pharisees, he said, woe to you hypocrites. We know they didn't like that. We know that angered them. To the people of Jesus' day, he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Many were put off by that. But it was true. To the Gentile woman, he said, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. But she's a little different, isn't she? She wasn't put off by that. She responded, but even the dogs want the scraps that fall, the crumbs that fall from the table. And remember Jesus, he marveled at her faith. To Pilate, he said, you would have no authority unless it was given to you from above. To Peter, he said, Simon, do you love me? Three times. But in that list, you see that some reacted to the things that they needed to hear. Even though if it was hard to hear, some reacted with the right response. Some grew closer and stronger to Jesus Christ and their faith in Him. You can't go home. Not if you're a prophet. Not if you're Jesus. But the wonderful thing is that there is a homecoming that Jesus invites all to. It's a homecoming where you won't be rejected. It's a homecoming where you will be welcomed. But it's a homecoming of all those, like those on that list, who had the right reaction to what they needed to hear. A reaction that said, yes, I am a dog. Yes, I am a sinner. Lord, make me anew. And Jesus said, welcome home. And so if you're here tonight, or if you're hearing this lesson, why don't you come home tonight? And if you need to do that, why don't you do that tonight? Let that be known as together we stand and as we sing.